afternoon. Uh, welcome to the Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Policy. My name is Peter Lowen. I'm the Associate Director for Global Engagement at the Monk School. I'm a professor of political science, and I'm the director of the Policy Elections and Representation Lab here at the Monk School. And it's my great pleasure today to uh, welcome to us, uh, unfortunately virtually rather than in person, uh, Brendan Nyhan, a Professor of Government at, at Dartmouth College, uh, for his talk on uh, Is U.S. Democracy Eroding? The state of U.S. democracy in uh, in 2020. Uh, I'll give a brief introduction uh, to, to Brendan, uh, one that would cover all of his accomplishments, would take most of the time we've got. But I'll let you know. I'll give you a bit of a lay of the uh, of the of the land here. He's a contributor to the Upshot, uh, New York Times uh, publication. He's been an Andrew Carnegie Fellow or Balfour Fellow. He's mm, uh, very notably the co-founder of Brightline Watch. Um, as an academic, he's published in uh, many of the leading journals, not only in political science but also in um, in general science, and he is, uh, by my lights, the most um, uh, uh, one of the leading, and I think, and, and I think one of the most um, thoughtful people working on the nature of misinformation and the challenge that poses to our to our politics. So it's a really great pleasure to have him here today. Before I, I turn the microphone over to uh, Brendan, I do want to acknowledge that um, the land on which the University of Toronto operates has, for thousands of years, been the traditional land of the Huron Wendat the Seneca, and most recently, the Mississaugas at the Credit River. Um, and today, this meeting place is still home to many people, Indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we're grateful to have the opportunity to live and to work uh, on this land. Um, Brendan, thanks very much for joining us. Uh, you've got, a, you've got a, a, a talk to give us, and then we have time for Q&A at the end. I'd encourage people to um, enter their questions into the Q&A function on Zoom um, and, uh, and to buckle in as I'm going to for what's going to be a really wonderful uh, talk. So, Brendan, thanks very much for joining us, and I'll turn it over to you. Thanks so much, Peter. It's wonderful to be here. I want to thank um, the university and the Monk School for having me um, and uh, for the opportunity to share with you the, um, the research that I've been doing with my colleagues at Brightline Watch, the organization that Peter mentioned, uh, which is a group of political scientists that I'm a part of that monitors the state of US democracy. We've been working on that mission since 2017 and it's unfortunately never been uh, more of an acute need than it is right now. So what I wanna share with you is um, some of the findings from our research and, and what I think they tell us about the state of US democracy uh, as we're only just days away uh, from the 2020 presidential election here where I am in the United States. So I'm gonna go ahead and uh, share my screen with you so I can uh, show you some slides here. Okay, so uh, again, this is joint work with my colleagues at Brightline Watch. Um, what I wanna talk about is the threat of democratic erosion in the United States. That's something that people have worried about since 2016 but I think never more so than in the last few months. What we've seen again and again since 2017, and especially uh, in the lead up to this election, is that our democracy here in the United States is more vulnerable than we fully understood or anticipated prior to Donald Trump entering the national political scene and then taking office. Um, I wanted to highlight uh, two vulnerabilities that have been revealed in our system that I'll talk about to you today after first showing you the evidence of democratic erosion that we've compiled during this period. Um, so why has that democratic erosion to the extent that it's happened taken place? So two critical factors that I think we need to worry about are first that our democratic system relies on extra constitutional norms. Well, I'll explain more what I mean by that, but basically the idea that there were informal sanctions or rules against certain kinds of behavior. Um, that have failed to deter President Trump and other members of his administration uh, when they take actions that are potentially dangerous or destabilizing to democracy. Um, and the second is um, the ways that polarization has undermined the potential negative political consequences of um, violating these norms. Um, and it's done so both among political elites, most notably the Republicans in Congress, um, but also uh, among the public. Okay. And in that context, the signs we're seeing of a president refusing to commit to the peaceful transfer of power are extremely worrisome. Um, and there's, there are also significant, uh, there's also significant risk of a pattern of what's called uh, constitutional hardball escalating 
in the coming years as the battle for power, um, uh, the, as the stakes of that conflict escalate between the parties here in the United States. So it's a very worrisome picture. And what I want to uh, do today is give you the best, our best assessment of where things stand here in the United States and what the risks are going forward. Okay, so um, the first thing to say about um, democracy in the United States is that it is very much a work in progress and really a recent phenomenon. Okay, so what we have here are experts' assessments of the state of US democracy when we ask them on a zero to 100 scale uh, to rate the quality of democracy of uh, the quality of democracy in the United States. And these experts are political scientists at universities across the United States, hundreds and hundreds of them that we survey every few months. And we've had a peaceful transfer of power under a constitutional system of government for a historically very long period here in the United States. But by most contemporary standards, the United States did not become a full-fledged democracy until the Civil Rights Act in 1965. And that's reflected in the pattern you can see here, where um, there's uh, the US only reaches a plateau is a kind of high quality democracy. Um, you know, you can see scoring at or above the range value of about 75 on this 100 point scale um, with the first administration, uh, with the first post civil rights date that we asked our experts about of 1975. So in that recent period, um, we've seen this gradual improvement of US democracy as uh, more people uh, are given the franchise and equal rights and limits on government power um, become uh, better developed, but it's only in recent decades that we get the kind of full-fledged democracy um, that is the envy of, of many places in the world uh, in that post-civil rights period. In that context, it was thought that US democracy was extraordinarily stable. Again, it, we'd had the peaceful transfer of power um, with the uh, very notable exception of the Civil War, of course, but you know, in the period since, um, we've had the peaceful transfer of power um, for well over 100 years. And um, countries like the United States, moreover, had almost never seen substantial democratic erosion. So what you have here, for example, um, is uh, data from a statistical model just suggesting how unlikely it was uh, it seemed to be that there would be a democratic breakdown, given the kinds of factors I'm describing, like how rich and stable the US is, right? It seemed, um, according to the, the statistical models, incredibly improbable. And I want to note, this is the percent chance of a breakdown. So the output for 2016 there is 0.03%. Okay, so that's a, a really um, almost infinitesimally tiny chance of some sort of uh, democratic breakdown. Um, but then we saw what we observed here in 2016. Um, and uh, my colleagues at Brightline Watch, who are political scientists uh, here at Dartmouth and at the University of Rochester and the University of Chicago, um, were among the organizers of a letter from political scientists who identified the kinds of uh, statements that, that President Trump was making and the kinds of actions he was taking as ones that were threatening to democracy um, and, and reflected the kinds of patterns we've seen in other countries where democratic erosion has taken place. They identified some concerns that will seem quite familiar, of course, at this point, like casting doubt on the validity of the election process, um, suggesting he may not accept the results of the election, encouraging voter suppression intimidation, um, calling for the jailing of the leader of the opposition party, attacking the independence of the judiciary, and so forth. So this pattern was clear um, even then, and I was raising concerns about it at the time as well. Um, what's notable though, especially as we think, as we move from the election to President Trump's time in office, is how closely his actions and statements mirror the patterns we've seen in other countries where democratic erosion has taken place. So the, the seminal book in this area is a book called How Democracies Die by two political scientists named um, Levitsky and Ziblatt. And they identify these four clusters of behaviors that they say are key indicators of this tendency towards authoritarianism that's associated with significant democratic erosion. Rejection of or weak commitment to democratic rules of the game, attacks on the legitimacy of your political opponents, 
tolerating or even encouraging political violence and a willingness to curtail the civil liberties of your opponents as well as the media. Right? So all of those um, find echoes in the kinds of statements President Trump was making in 2016 and in his behavior since then. Um, at the same time though, of course, democracy in the US did not end when President Trump took office. And so it was easy to lose sight of the threat. So um, my friends at the Wall Street Journal editorial page uh, wrote an editorial just mere months after Trump took office, um, uh, ridiculing the idea that there was a concern about democratic erosion under Donald Trump and attacking me and another academic who had raised concerns, um, basically saying, um, you know, Donald Mussolini hasn't taken over. He's actually not even a very uh, effective or strong president. Isn't it ludicrous to think that there's any kind of an authoritarian threat here? Okay. The problem, though, is that this misunderstands the nature of democratic erosion and the risk that we face here in the United States. What Levitsky and Zibot tell us in their book is that the model you should think of when you consider democratic erosion is not a binary uh, choice between democracy and dictatorship. The mid 20th century model of fascist takeovers is the wrong way to think about the threat. Modern democratic erosion happens via a much more gradual process. Okay, they say there's no single moment in which the regime obviously crosses the line to dictatorship. And those who denounce government abuse may be dismissed as exaggerating or crying wolf. It may be almost imperceptible. Okay? And this is precisely the fear we should worry about. Uh, just because Donald Trump didn't immediately eliminate all safeguards and guardrails when he took office does not mean there was no risk. Okay, And that's what we've seen in the period since then. In fact, since Donald Trump took office, experts rate the quality of democracy here in the United States as substantially worse than they did prior, than they do for 2015 or prior periods. You can see data here. Um, these are data uh, most recently rated by experts in August of 2020. And you can see a substantial decline in how they assess the quality of US democracy. Now, not the, the, the value that they give to US democracy is still above that pre-civil rights level, but it's a significant decline relative to where we were prior to when President Trump took office. And I want to emphasize this is not specific to our data. This is not a, an artifact of who we asked or how we asked it. This is data from the Respected Varieties of Democracy uh, project, which also measures um, different kinds of indicators of so-called liberal democracy. So they, they define it here as emphasizing the importance of protecting rights against the tyranny of the state and the tyranny of the majority. And they find uh, this, this group, Varieties of Democracy, again, finds a substantial decline in how well that ideal is uh, evaluated as being upheld in the United States. The Economist has a rating of democracy at the country level, finds the same thing. So there's an there's a expert consensus at this point that there has been a deterioration of US democracy. And again, I want to emphasize that kind of deterioration can be difficult to notice precisely because it is not as dramatic as the kind of takeovers and coups we saw in the past. But nonetheless, it could be very damaging to the restraints on government power and the protections um, offered to people who are vulnerable. So let's get more specific about democratic erosion. It was one of the important findings in this literature is that uh, democratic erosion can happen in a, a piecemeal process. It's not necessarily consistent across the many different areas um, in which uh, it could take place. So um, at Brightline Watch, we asked our experts about US democratic performance in a series of areas. Um, the, the way elections are conducted and held, the um, rights to vote and the effect of voting, um, uh, the other rights that people have and how well they're protected, including protests and popular speech and so forth. Um, other kinds of protections against political violence or tax on political opponents or journalists, accountability for uh, people in office, um, limits on the power of the executive, and uh, the quality of political discourse, including a common understanding of relevant facts, um, seeking compromise, ref refraining from attacking the loyalty or patriotism of your opponent. 
So there's a bunch of different aspects of democracy, this multifaceted concept that we might consider. And um, what we wanted to do was to not just say, well, democracy is declining, but to, to measure in these specific areas, um, how do experts evaluate the performance of US democracy in all these areas of concern? And um, what they report as we surveyed them over time, what's reflected here are results from a series of these expert surveys we've conducted since early 2017. We find substantial declines in a number of these areas of democratic performance. And I wanna highlight the five largest declines we've seen. Okay, so what you're seeing here is the proportion of uh, experts who indicate that the US is performing uh, relatively well in these different areas. Okay. And the five areas of decline, um, we see three related to constraints on executive power and two related to uh, unpopular speech or protections of political of opponents of the governing regime. So you can see here, we see declines of over 20 percentage points in, um, in the proportion of experts um, who think the constitution, the legislature and the judiciary are effectively limiting the power of the, exec of the executive. Those are again, declines relative to February uh, uh, or uh, I believe July, 2017, um, depending on the, the, the statement in question. We also see um, declines of 20 to 30 percentage points in the proportion of experts who are saying um, that government agencies don't punish the political opponents of the regime and that protest is tolerated by the government. Okay, so those uh, clearly in, uh, reflecting, uh, for instance, um, the use of government power uh, against uh, Joe Biden in the scandal that led to uh, hit, uh, President Trump's impeachment um, and uh, the uh, efforts to suppress uh, protests that have resulted from the death of George Floyd um, in recent months. We've seen uh, significant declines associated with those events in the corresponding democratic principles. So um, our experts are not just seeing then declines in the um, perceived quality of US democracy, but in these specific areas of, of core concern, limits on executive power, um, misuse of government power against political opponents, toleration of protest against the government. Um, so I told you that uh, there were two uh, kinds of um, uh, ways that uh, democracy um, depended on these extra constitutional norms that are identified in this book by Levitsky and Ziblatt. Okay, um, so these extra constitutional norms, again, they're not laws or rules, but they are patterns of behavior that were thought to be backed by threat of sanction informally that helped to constrain people in power. Okay, and what in, 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 in their book, Levitsky and Ziblatt point to these two norms as critical to the effective uh, maintenance of democracy and the continued peaceful transfer of power. Acknowledging the legitimacy of your opposition and, um, and, and tolerating it uh, and, and then refraining from using uh, government power while you are in office uh, in ways that tilt the playing field um, unfairly against the opposition. They call this forbearance. Okay. Um, and these are in a well-functioning democracy um, part of the exchange of power. Uh, you are in power now, but you know you'll be out of power later. And it's important for you to acknowledge the legitimacy of your opposition and to refrain from using government power against them because even though you're in power today, you may be out of power tomorrow. Um, what we see in the United States though is a pattern that looks like a, a series of violations of these norms. Um, where steps taken by President Trump or members of his administration violate these norms. Um, and, uh, and it's revealed how many kinds of anti-democratic practices are not prohibited by law. We instead depended on these norms and we only notice the role those norms, norms were playing when they are violated. So here are just a few examples, right? The use of law enforcement or the Department of Justice um, to aid your political allies or to attack your political opponents. Um, the scandals related to uh, James Comey, the former FBI director, and Michael Flynn, the former national security advisor, 
um, investigating your political opponents, as with the Ukraine scandal that led to President Trump's impeachment, attacking the press, which the president does systematically. He frequently calls them an enemy of the people, a kind of Stalinist slogan of totalitarian regimes, attacking election legitimacy, which we'll talk about more. The president constantly promotes baseless claims of widespread voter fraud, um, respecting dissent and protest. Um, the president uh, uh, and his administration deployed um, federal law enforcement in an unprecedented way in Washington, D.C. during the protests after the Floyd death. President uh, Trump talked about, tweeted about um, when the looting starts, the shooting starts in a way that was thought to be intimidating and potentially encouraging of violence. The list goes on and on. So in every case, I want to underscore, these are legal actions. They are not prohibited under the Constitution or under U.S. law. We instead depended on the president to refrain from taking these kinds of actions for, we, we depend on the president to respect the norms against these kinds of actions. Um, but as we've seen, uh, when violated, um, these norms, um, you know, uh, they simply aren't uh, binding in the, under current circumstances. And the reason, the reason is um, the polarization, of course, that the United States now uh, suffers from to such a great extent. We saw that most dramatically here in the United States in the vote uh, to convict the president and remove him from office during his Senate uh, trial after his impeachment, where only uh, one Republican um, broke ranks, Mitt Romney. Um, and we continue to see it as the president takes various actions that violate the kinds of norms I've been describing and member Republican members of Congress uh, refrain from speaking out against him or defending the norms he's violating. So an example here, after President Trump, um, uh, after his administration um, deployed law enforcement to tear gas protesters so that he could stage a photo op in front of a church near the White House, a series of Republican senators walked by the press and gave various excuses as to why they couldn't comment on what had just happened. So Mike Enzi was late for lunch and couldn't be bothered to defend the principle of the right to protest. In a, in a democracy. Now, if members of Congress won't stand up to this kind of behavior, what about the public? Um, we've been serving the public uh, since 2017 to see how they perceive US democracy as well, and to see whether they would stand up for the kinds of democratic principles that are under threat. And at first, the uh, results seem encouraging. So when we asked them about the importance of the principles that I described to you earlier, um, the principles like everyone having an equal right to vote, uh, elections being held without fraud, and so forth. Um, Democrats and Republicans, approvers of President Trump and people who disapprove of him, have relatively similar views about the importance of those principles. There is not a great, a high degree of polarization over those principles, which we found to be quite encouraging. The problem, though, is that we've seen again and again there's substantial polarization in the extent to which. Americans believe those principles are being upheld in practice. And it breaks down along partisan lines and along the lines of approval for President Trump in precisely the way you would expect. So um, as you can see here, for instance, this is data from March of 2020, but it's very similar um, over all the surveys we've done. There are a number of these democratic principles where uh, Trump approvers see the country as performing much better um, on that principle uh, than do uh, people who disapprove of his, um, his performance in office. Um, and in many cases, the areas that Trump approvers view the country as doing relatively well in are ones that our experts have identified as areas where there's been substantial democratic erosion. For instance, those limits on executive power I described to you earlier. Um, the polarization is even greater when you think about members of the public who, who, whom politicians might be most responsive to. So what I am showing you here are data from we collected back in 2019, where we not only surveyed members of the public, but we surveyed uh, high-end campaign donors, so people who give a substantial amount of money in U.S. elections. And what we often found, is that, as the graph suggests, although it's a bit complicated, those triangles you can see that are often at either end of each row are approvers of President Trump or disapprovers who are donors. You can see they're often more polarized than members of the public and often quite dramatically so um, in their evaluations of US democratic performance. So there doesn't seem to be a public consensus that these 
democratic principles are being violated in practice. And that's undermining the, pol the, the potential political consequences we depend on um, to dissuade politicians from violating these norms in practice. Um, we also sought to explore uh, whether the public would recognize these kinds of violations in a more direct way. So we asked people about a series of areas where um, there was a potential concern about democratic performance. And in each of these areas, we, we described an, a, an action the government might take that we characterize as being pro-democracy and then a transgression of that democratic norm. So if you, as you can see in the, the bottom left there, um, the government allowing a peaceful protest by its political opponents versus blocking a peaceful protest by its political opponents. And we want to see how the public would perceive those. Would they perceive the pro-democratic actions as pro-democracy pro and vice versa for the transgressions? Um, and across a number of these that we asked about, we found uh, quite a consistent consensus for the most part on the pro-democratic actions. So Trump approvers and disapprovers um, largely agreed and there was there I was often at a very high level that the pro-democratic actions were moderately or very democratic. But when it came to those transgressions that I identified, we often saw quite substantial polarization. Many more disapprovers than approvers were identifying those transgressions as being moderately or very undemocratic. Um, one example there you can see is constraints on uh, executive power. Okay, so that's an area where um, Trump approvers were much less likely to see a transgression, a violation of those constraints on executive power. Um, they were much less likely to see that as undemocratic than were people who disapproved of President Trump. Um, an even more uh, direct indication of the reason for concern, um, when uh, a different set of researchers asked people whether they thought it was a, a good way to govern the country, whether a good way to govern the country would be to have a strong leader who doesn't have to bother with Congress and elections, Congress or just elections. You can see there that if you just say Congress, 39% of Republicans think it's a very good or fairly good way to govern the country, to have a strong leader who doesn't have to bother with Congress, as well as 45% of independents. So those numbers go down somewhat. If you look at elections, people do seem to want to have a role um, the public to have a role in, um, uh, in you know, evaluating people in power. But we've seen, of course, that there are many authoritarian or semi-authoritarian countries that continue to have elections. So that's often a very weak check. Um, given that difficulty we've just identified, that people may not recognize undemocratic actions, I think it's very concerning that we've seen such a pattern of abnormal behavior that violates those democratic norms. So what we have here are data from our expert surveys at Brightline Watch where we've asked experts um, about a series of events and we asked them to rate those events separately on how normal or abnormal they are and how unimportant or important they are. What you're seeing here are the events of the Trump administration through August of 2020 that were identified by experts as the most both important and abnormal. So distinguishing those abnormal important events from, from those that were important, but actually not that abnormal. They were more like what other presidents do on the one hand and distinguishing them also from abnormal events that aren't especially consequential. So these are, Kate, these are events that experts indicate are highly abnormal and quite consequential. And the experts identify many of the kinds of behaviors that we've been discussing in the period that I've been speaking with you today from the press being called the enemy of the people to pressuring Ukraine to investigate Joe Biden, President Trump's uh, potential future rival. Um, so there's, all, and, and what I just want you to see here is how many events of the Trump administration experts classify in this range um, of being mostly important to important and being mostly abnormal to abnormal. This is not um, you know, a series of isolated examples. There's a long pattern of these kinds of events piling up and we'll have even more in our next report, which is coming out next week. So what I wanna conclude by doing is talking about the warning signs we're facing here right now. Um, we've seen the president intensify his rhetoric again, uh, attacking the legitimacy of elections here in the United States, calling them rigged, suggesting there's widespread uh, voting by people who don't have legal status. Um, and then most recently, attacking voting by mail, 
that's a mechanism of voting that is fully legal, that gives no partisan advantage to either side, is in widespread use in many states in the United States, and has previously been uncontroversial. Um, and importantly, there's no evidence of widespread fraud by uh, in mail voting any more than there is in any other means of legal voting here in the United States. And yet the president over and over again has said the election is being rigged and that it will be stolen or in some way um, compromised by fraud uh, uh, you know, that takes place through the use of vote by mail. And you can see here that rhetoric has been uh, offered by the president again and again and again in a way we haven't seen before. There is no modern precedent for a president to attack the legitimacy of the election um, in this way. And it's, it's very worrisome uh, given that he's not only attacking the legitimacy of the election, but he's refused to commit to the peaceful transfer of power, which is the core of democracy itself. The willingness of the incumbent candidate to uh, the incumbent uh, office holder to stand down and peacefully give power uh, to the opposition, to recognize the legitimacy of your defeat, to rec recognize the legitimacy of the opposition's victory, and to hand power to them. Instead, the president is setting the stage to call the results into question. Uh, and, uh, and there's reason to worry that some people um, may be ready for that kind of rhetoric, may be ready to refuse to accept the legitimacy of this election. Um, polling here uh, from earlier this year uh, finds that um, a substantial uh, minority of Republicans um, would say it's very or somewhat appropriate uh, or don't that they don't know whether it's appropriate for President Trump to refuse to leave office. 29% appropriate, 15% don't know. That's still a minority, but it's an uncomfortably uh, large one. Um, we see also um, a substantial number of Democrats being open to a call for a do-over election because a Democratic candidate claims to have evidence of interference um, and so forth. So the public is um, you know, worryingly open to these kinds of claims, at least minorities are. And uh, a president who um, encouraged them, who said the election was stolen from them, who denied the legitimacy of their defeat, um, it could be very destabilizing to the Democratic system here in the United States. Um, and even if President Trump is defeated by the margin the polls suggest and is forced to concede his defeat um, in the aftermath of the election, um, the, the threat or the concern is not over here. Um, there's been an ongoing trend towards greater escalation in the use of um, legal powers under the Constitution or in our political system that the parties have generally um, refrained from uh, from employing that are now being used more aggressively, what sometimes what's sometimes called constitutional hardball. And the worry that scholars have is a kind of escalatory spiral where one side takes an action, the other takes, uh, uh, you know, violates norms even further in response. And that kind of spiral uh, takes the US and its democracy to an even more unstable place. Um, and one potential precipitating factor for that kind of an escalatory spiral could be um, the potential for an expansion of the Supreme Court um, uh, in 2021 under a potential Biden administration. Now, that's a complicated issue. There are a lot of factors to consider there. I'm happy to talk about that more in the Q&A if you'd like. But I think it's worth considering in the context I've been describing to you earlier. Um, we are not uh, entering a debate over the expansion of the court in a period where um, U.S. democracy is stable and robust, and the shared commitment to the rules of the game are, is strong. In fact, we, precisely the opposite. And that may make that debate especially explosive and potentially destabilizing. So the worry I, I want to leave you with is a kind of worst case scenario, but it's not one that scholars would rule out. Okay? Um, again, I've tried to convey that dem democracy is not a binary concept, and there are many gradations between a free and full democracy on the one hand and a dictatorship on the other. And the regime type that many scholars of other um, uh, democ of, of government in other countries have pointed to as a risk, uh, a potential outcome, if things get bad enough here in the United States is what's called competitive authoritarianism, okay? And in those countries, there is still, there are still typically elections um, and those elections are typically generally free of massive fraud, but incumbents, um, do things like harass, abuse state resources, deny the opposition media coverage, harass opposition candidates and supporters, um, 
threaten journalists and opposition politicians and so forth. That's the fear of what could happen if these trends continue in the United States. And that's why the stakes right now for US democracy are so serious. So I will stop there and uh, I look forward to your questions. Please do put those into the Q&A. Um, love to hear from everybody. Brendan, thanks very much. I'll let Dario open my video back on here in a sec, uh, I think. Uh, and I encourage you, if you've got questions, to drop them into the Q&A. Brendan, I've got, I've got lots for you. Let's, um, I want to talk a little bit about the repair to, uh, start my video here. I want to talk a little bit about the kind of repairing of this. So let's just work on the assumption that Donald Trump doesn't win the election um, on, uh, uh, in November, on November 3rd. And that there is there is a, there is a peaceful transition of power. Let's 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 presume that's the case. And your Biden administration working on resetting um, resetting some of these things. Can you talk about this in the context, for example, of court packing? Because I think this is this is an interesting example. And I'll just tell you my own sense of it is it is the following: that that um, uh, Cliff Orwin, a, a, a professor here at the U of T, wrote a wrote a pretty I don't think a very well received editorial in the Globe and Mail or National Paper. Basically arguing that look, Trump has every right to fill the court with uh, with uh, uh, with the justice, and he's doing so right. And it may be a violation of a norm, but it's not a violation of any law, right? Or it may be a violation of an expectation, but it's not a violation of any law. Nonetheless, people might view this as 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 uh, kind of of a piece with all these other things that Trump has done. But I think we would agree, right, that if we were looking at uh, uh, that if Trump had decided to pack the court, you know, uh, he's he's in a position where he has he has the power to, to bring justice through and his control of the Senate. What if he decided to try to expand the size of the Supreme Court by, by two justices and put in two more Republicans, right? That if he'd had the, the foresight to do that, I think we would take that as a signal of democratic backsliding. So, so what kind of bind does it put someone like Biden in that one possibility, what does it tell us that one possibility that people are talking about openly for correcting some of the, of the, of the, of the backsliding over the last number of years is potentially, you know, some uh, kind of a backsliding of its own sort, right? Uh, uh, to engage in to engage in uh, uh, in court packing. Yeah, this is a hard one. Um, I, I think right now, um, I can't speak for you know Democrats, of course, but let me let me speak for the scholars of, of of democratic erosion that we're you know consulting with and surveying. I think they they struggle with on the one hand the risk of politicization of the court. They see the way the Garland nomination was blocked and then that seat filled and then this um, very quick confirmation of Amy Coney, Coney Barrett as furthering the politicization of the court. And so some of them see a court packing that simply counterbalances those two seats being filled. So if they're, if those would have been one and one absent the Garland blockade, you add two seats to the court and then simply it, the equivalent is created. Now, the scenario there is that the court packing or the threat thereof constrains future escalation, right? That you're essentially playing a kind of tit for tat game <coughs> there that brings the escalation of the politicization of the judiciary to an end. And if you don't do that, you've essentially unilaterally disarmed in a way that encourages further use of these kinds of tactics. But you could simply, you could easily tell the story the other way that simply then the next move is that the next Republican president feels pressure to expand the court further. And I just wanna be clear for our, our, our viewers, um, there's nothing under the constitution that sets the number of justices on the Supreme Court. So that can be changed at any time. It is one of these things that is only a norm. Um, and it's just, it, it has been nine for a long time, but it doesn't have to be. And in principle, every, um, every uh, president could um, try to expand the court if a Senate would go along. Let's let's just talk about that a bit more broadly, and then I want to go to a question from 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 Joseph Heath. But what's the what's the balance here for for a Biden presidency in trying to um, actively correct things, actively correct violations that have occurred, as opposed to just bringing the temperature down? I mean, what's your what's your sense of what's your sense of the strategies that he's got in front of him if he wants to try to correct this? Because because you know one 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 interpretation is that this is this is a special moment in time and it just simply is a, uh, it's just simply a moment that may pass, right? And the other is that there's been massive, um, 
um, injuries to the body politic here that need to be the need to be actively, you know, surgically healed, right? What's your what's your sense of, of of the strategies that are in front of them? Which ones are possible? What's what's the what's the best course of action? I mean, the other piece of this that I think we should talk about is the potential for um, adding new states to the union, um, where again people see that um, now this part of the reason there's so much pressure on Biden here isn't just a Garland blockade, it's that the Supreme Court is so out of balance with the political balance of power in this country. The same applies to the Senate, which now has um, uh, quite a massive skew in terms of the extent to which it favors the Republicans. Um, and so that puts a lot of pressure on Biden to potentially add seats to the Senate um, in a way that would counterbalance that tendency. Now, Democrats would say, these steps are simply recalibrating back towards equilibrium so that these institutions reflect the political balance of power in this country. But again, it's easy to see how um, an action like adding two states, though again, it has historical precedence here in the United States, might be seen as a kind of escalation that would in turn spur further escalation. Again, I'm not sure you can do that and say, okay, now the temperature must go down, right? We've rebalanced things. Now everybody calm down. And in particular, I want to highlight, Peter, the importance of thinking about the state of the Republican Party when this is taking place. So if Donald Trump loses, and he loses by the kinds of margins the polls suggest, there will be a moment when this party will, at least to some extent, re-examine what's taken place and the direction it's currently on. That is a moment when Republicans who don't share the president's predilection for these kinds of democracy eroding steps could um, gain uh, more influence within the party coalition. But if Democrats are at that time um, adding two seats to the court and, and, two, uh, and two states to uh, the Senate, that's going to undermine their ability to find their footing, right? Because the people in the caucus who want to fight all out partisan warfare will say, look, the Democrats are breaking all the rules to entrench their power. Why should we step? Why should we hold back? Why shouldn't we be just as maximalist? So that's the that's the kind of that's how that dynamic I'm describing could potentially evolve in that hypothetical. Yeah, that's really the great temptation in this great moral tale, isn't it? Right, that 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 to that to save the to save the system, you have to be willing to you have to be willing to to to, to not do what was done to you, right? Um, and uh, humanity is not full of examples of that. We've got a great question from our uh, our colleague, a philosopher, Joseph Heath, in the in the chat. I'll read it out so everyone can see it or can hear it, but it's it's quite a good question. Uh, not to be pedantic, it's a great way to start, Joe, not to be pedantic, but some of the concerns you expressed, such as the control of the executive or manipulation of the Department of Justice, seem to me concerns about, quote, liberalism and not, quote, democracy per se. If one takes separation of powers to be traditional, the traditional preoccupation of political liberalism and not democracy per se. The distinction seems to me somewhat important in that populists like Trump often appeal to democratic values to attack these traditional liberal constraints on the power of democratic majorities. No, that's a fair point, and I should I should have I think been more clear. And I appreciate the um, reminder from our our philosopher colleagues that I'm really thinking of democracy in its fuller form as liberal democracy, as binding together the kind of rule by the people through the kinds of mechanisms that human beings have devised, as well as these protections on protections of rights and limitations on powers. I'm thinking of uh, when our when our experts are are rating the quality of democracy, they're really I think reading that through the prism, not just of bare democracy per se, but this larger bundle of principles that liberal democracy is supposed to uphold. Um, and if I can add on to that, Peter, quickly, um, please, what please. I think is, is, is really important about uh, the Trump case, it's different from many of the cases of democratic erosion we've seen before, is that he isn't that popular. <laughs> so many of the um, populist authoritarians, uh, leaders we've seen in other parts of the world have one large majorities, they have been quite popular. Um, they have used plebiscites and other mechanisms to say, look, the people are with me and that's why you should change the constitution, punish my political opponents and so forth. We haven't seen that here. Donald Trump lost a popular vote. He's never had majority support in almost any credible poll um, measuring job approval or, or anything else. So he is a kind of minority president in that way. Um, so even his claims to kind of democratic legitimacy in that narrower sense, I think, are are, are quite weak. But I appreciate the distinction, and I'm, I appreciate the uh, your colleague for bringing it up. Yeah, the, the, I'd like to, I'd like to draw you out more on what's interesting about Trump as a as a 
as a leader and as a, as a populist and, and indeed as, a, as an autocrat. I was having a conversation with a colleague before this talk just to, to think about some things I would want to ask. And, and their observation was um, that what's remarkable with Trump is kind of his, his, almost his ineptitude, that he's, that he's not actually a well-seasoned political actor. So if you think about very successful autocrats from around the world, put Vladimir Putin at the top of that pile, this is someone who, who genuinely understands how to pull the levers of power, who is who outsmarts his opponents regularly, who understands the mix of both extra constitutional and constitutional things that he can do to maintain his position in power, um, and has you know on, on more than on more than one occasion extended his his capacity to to rule in terms of time in a way that Trump only uh, only dreams of out loud at his at his at his at his fevered rallies, right? What does it say? And I guess the question is, what does this say about the actual, the actual robustness of American political institutions? If someone like Trump, who is driven by personality to break everything, but 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 doesn't seem to me to be actually very sophisticated at it, can do so much damage in such a short period of time. I I, I think we should be profoundly worried by that. Um, I think this is an underappreciated point. Um, at first in Trump's presidency, there was a tendency to laugh it off. Oh, he's just saying things. He can't possibly follow through on it. We've seen though over time in his own largely inept way, he's gotten at least more people around him who will follow through on the kinds of dictates that might otherwise have been ignored earlier in his administration. So I don't take full comfort from this, but I would say it is striking that someone who exercises power more ineffectively than any contemporary president um, is still able to do so much damage. Um, and what I would encourage people to think about is what the, 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 the vulnerabilities Trump um, has revealed and what a more effective authoritarian style leader could do um, under um, these conditions, right? If even Trump can do this much damage, someone who can barely sit through an intelligence briefing, let alone uh, effectively wield the, the, the tools of power, what could some kind of hyper competent authoritarian leader do in that office. We've um, we've given great power to the president, and uh, the, the limits on them have become quite weak here in the United States. And I think um, the prospect of a competent Trump is one that should trouble everybody. I want to ask you about. Uh, I want to encourage people if they have questions. I'm not sure the Q and A function is working, but you can put questions into the chat. So please do it. Do it there. One of the one of the main points, Brendan, about about. Um, how democracies die. This, 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 this great work by our colleagues is um, is that much of it has to do with the role of conservative parties and their willingness to to um, to be uh, willing accomplices in this, to to accelerate decline of democracy or their or their desire to stand up stand up against it. Um, I can tell you that I've personally, um, if 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 you could bet money on the Democratic Party or the Republican Party defending democracy, I would have lost a lot of money uh, already. I, I, I would have. I presumed much more opposition at, at many points than I've seen. Um, but what's your sense of what that party does? Let's let's presume that the projections are 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 correct in the main that that Trump is going to lose and lose noticeably and more than he should as as a as a as a first term as an incumbent um, running. What's your sense of of the paths for the Republican Party, both the kind of the possible paths or so walk us through the scenarios, and then where where do you think they'll which path do you think they'll walk? Yeah, so let me let me give three scenarios that, that people might uh, consider. Um, the first is I think there were still a few people who will try to pretend everything is like it was, that essentially the reboot of Paul Ryan, Mitt Romney Republicanism is about to be launched on um, January 21st if Biden wins. Um, and we're gonna go back to you know, free markets and the kinds of um, appeals um, that Mitt Romney and to a lesser extent John McCain were offering prior to Trump. Um, I'm, I think that's increasingly taken uh, less seriously in part because the primary in 2016 revealed how tissue thin the support was for that style of republicanism. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess what I would consider to be more plausible are kind of two, two paths where one is a kind of co-optation path um, and one is a kind of uh, you know, Trumpist GOP. Um, the co-optation path is um, someone like Nikki Haley, who served in Trump's administration, was seen as a kind of establishment figure whose reputation wasn't destroyed by that experience. She has um, adopted some of the rhetorical tropes of Trumpism without the most hard-edged elements. Um, 
you can imagine someone like her trying to knit together um, the establishment faction of the party with the Trumpist faction. Um, it's possible that someone like that incorporating more of a hard edge on immigration and more nationalist and law and order appeals might be able to kind of suck the air out of the room, kind of defang the appeal of Trumpism, that in part the appeal of Trumpism was because the Republican Party was pivoting in a direction on immigration and identity issues that just deviated so dramatically from the preferences of its base. Um, uh, so I, I see that as kind of one potential path. The other path is a kind of what people think that, you know, Donald Trump Jr., Tucker Carlson, um, Tom Cotton, right, who are kind of rebooting Trumpism and seeing if they can, you know, get the magic going again without Trump himself, which I think is a really open question because a lot of the elements of Trumpism when other candidates have tried to adapt them haven't had, haven't worked nearly as well. Um, for all of his limitations we were talking about, um, he is a very effective performer. It's not like other people can go up on stage and do that and have crowds respond, right? Go watch Tom Cotton on TV. He is not about to do like hour and a half rallies with 15,000 people, right? It's just not happening. Um, so, um, you know, but, but I, I do expect some people to uh, attempt a successor version of Trumpism um, that pushes in that direction. And what could be, you know, again, I wanna, I wanna underscore the kind of threat here. They could say Trump didn't go for, far enough. There's totally a version of that style of politics that says the election was stolen from us in 2020. Um, the establishment, you know, um, you know, basically undermined Donald Trump's administration from the beginning. I won't let them, I'll go further. I'll run things with an iron hand. That kind of appeal is absolutely on the table. Yeah, and this is where the ineptitude leaves the question open, right? Because Trump, for example, so, so, so imagine the counterfactual in which Trump is successful administratively, right? And he's actually able to bring through a massive stimulus package he, uh, uh, or massive infrastructure package, uh, excuse me, he's able to effectively actually move the levers on trade deals in a way that actually does, you know, does more to renationalize industry. They actually did a fair amount of that with NAFTA, right? I mean, effectively, we've, we've, we're using tariffs as an instrument now to, to support the, the, the North American auto industry. But imagine he'd be able to do a lot more of that a lot more effectively. And we could actually see whether this kind of reorienting of the Republican coalition has policy substance to it, right? It becomes a real party of not only culturally conservative people, but 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 the working class, right? And that I think was that that's the open question now in some ways about where that coalition goes. Um, and um, I think I think you're right that it's hard to it's it, it's hard to imagine a performer like Trump coming in, but it's not hard to imagine someone who tries to follow that policy package, right? For better or for worse, to reorient the party system. And, and, and that's a great point. And I want to I want to just reinforce it that people forget how Trump campaigned in 2016. He was seen as uh, unusually moderate by the public, in part because at least when he started running, he talked about the economy in a very different way than Republicans had. He eventually was driven to a large tax cut, but that wasn't his starting point. He promised mm -hmm. not to cut entitlements. Um, you know, he talked about the impacts of trade. All, and then, you know, there was supposed to be this kind of emphasis on infrastructure um, uh, and government building that never actually happened. Now, the Republican Party, the kind of uh, corrupt bargain it made was it, it kind of dialed all of that back and got a conventional Republican policy approach and judges in trade for not uh, you know, for not objecting to the worst aspects of, of Trumpism. But I agree that that path, I didn't map that out. That path is as yet untaken. Trump never governed that way. Yes. Um, but his but his but his campaign in 2016 showed it it, it could have some appeal, um, and the party's establishment may be weaker in, in its ability to beat that back than than they might think. Yeah, and that's the big that's the big that's the big fight that could be coming right is between the kind of Wall Street Republicans who were who are happy with this big tax cut because they could get it from him, but that's not in the offing unless the U.S. wants to blow deficits forever. That's not in the offing in a in a kind of blue collar reindustrialized strategy. Uh, for the Republican Party. A question here from Quinn Albaugh, uh, a great postdoc here at uh, U of T via, via Princeton. Um, and Quinn is asking, to what extent do you expect that the transition of power will actually be peaceful, as Peter was assuming? Um, how much should we expect to see riots or other types of violence? What do you expect to happen if Trump simply refuses to accept the result? That's a great question. Um, so uh, first, I just want to give a preview that Brightline Watch will have a report out on this on Monday morning on our website. So please do um, check that out where we've asked experts about these scenarios. 
Um, what I'll say is um, I'm worried. I guess um, I am not as worried as some people about Trump literally refusing to leave office. I am worried instead about when he says he refuses to, in a, so let me be specific. I am not worried about Trump literally refusing to leave office in a scenario where he clearly is defeated and there are no Florida style controversies over the outcome of the election, right? So if Biden wins by eight points and the election isn't down, doesn't come down to one state, it's hard to imagine Trump trying to stay in the White House. Like he will be defeated, but he could refuse to accept the peaceful transfer of power in the, set, in the sense that he never accepts the legitimacy of his defeat. And he kind of poisons the well for his successor in saying the election was stolen from him. Um, uh, similarly with violence, I think sometimes people have these binary senses, but I would just encourage people to think about the gradations of violence and disorder that could take place. There are many kinds of bad outcomes that are uh, between nothing and um, you know, civil war. And again, the, the public discourse gets far too binary, but there's a lot of room for um, disruption. And then what I worry about most is a Florida style scenario with a president who has shown this willingness to tra transgress. And that's where I think the potential both for elite transgression and for violence is greatest, right? Imagine a world with a Florida style count where the president is saying on TV, on Fox, in his Twitter accounts, that the election is being stolen from him by those people in that building in a country as heavily armed as the United States. That's the kind of context in which terrible things can happen. Um, it's also the kind of context experts worry about. Um, uh, at that point, you know, do uh, state legislatures try to pull back um, you know, allocating electors via popular vote and send their own slate of electors to the electoral college to change the outcome of the election? At that point, potentially everything is on the table. And even people who say they're for the peaceful transfer of power in the abstract may not stand up when the chips are down, right? And that's, again, I think it's easy to say you're for the peaceful transfer of power in the abstract. It's harder to follow through on it when you're that close to victory. And, and, and that's precisely the situation where um, the kinds of actions that we're worried about are unfortunately most uh, likely to actually be observed. I want to return just to, to one, one, one final question about the Republican Party, um, which is, what, is that, what does that party do? Uh, let's presume Trump loses, they lose his, you know, by, a, by some measurable margin. Um, he slinks out of office or, or, or uh, 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 sulks out of office, uh, but then decides to take another crack at it in 2024. What does a what does the Republican Party do at this point to to reorient itself if it can, or is it, or is it simply captured by him potentially for another four years? That's a great question. Um, it, it seems like he could prevent, he could play a a really important role in preventing the party from moving forward or kind of sucking up the oxygen that um, would have allowed new faces in the party to emerge, right? Um, in the way. Um, that um, you know the persistence of these older Democratic politicians has, has kind of prevented a new generation from emerging. Democrats have, have this; their leading ranks are dominated by people in their 60s and 70s, and they they never created space for other figures to emerge. Um, mm -hmm. In 2016, Trump got so much media attention there was very little media oxygen for anyone else to emerge. I can imagine the same in 2024, right? The new generation of Republican politicians who might be developing a national profile and talking about the direction the party might want to go. If Trump is starting his own media venture and or toying with running for office again, if his health allows it in 2024, um, it's, um, yeah, it's going to be, it's going to be hard to move on. Now, I will say just, uh, you know, this is not quite an exact comparison, but it's worth thinking about. Sarah Palin, for those of you who remember, was a very big deal in 2008. She was in, in some ways a kind of pre-Trump figure in the reception, in the kind of appeal she used and the reception she got. Um, but she leaves office in, um, in Alaska not long after running as vice president, um, starts a media venture and stuff, disappears from the face of the earth, okay? And it, there was something about like outside of that context, she did not have the same magic and the same aura. And um, I wonder if the same could, could happen to Trump, particularly um, if, forces in the party are looking to sideline him. Um, now, I think maybe the last key question to think about, um, Peter, and this is the, the world we live in now, what does Fox do, right? Um, you know, that's, that, that might be the most important question for all of this, right? Because it is, it is such an important institution in the modern Republican party. The way they pivoted on Trump in 2016 when they saw where the base is going was critical to him consolidating the party. 
Um, and the question is, if and when do they pivot away from him? Because right now they're pretty much Trump 24 seven in a way that they may consider changing if he loses. Yes. Brendan, we have everything in the world but time. So thanks very much for your, uh, for your, for the hour you've given us. It's been very, it's very, very helpful for, for me, clarifying how to think about this, to, to put it in context and to get some, some markers to understand the uh, kind of the uncharted waters that we're into uh, uh, in the next, uh, the next few months. Hope we can have you back soon. And thanks very, very much for joining us at the Monk School. Thanks, everyone.